Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you decided to join us. As you may know, we are studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and we're beginning the series of lessons for the months of July, August, and September of 2013. This series is on Revival and Reformation, and this first lesson is entitled, Revival, Our Great Need. It's lesson one in that series, as I mentioned, for July 6 of 2013. If you would like to look at the materials that we use in our discussion that we prepared specially, uh, they will be available at our, on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. Before we begin, however, we would really like to have you grab your Bible, maybe in several versions if you have them available, as we have several versions available here, and We'd also like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, who would know better than you what our great need is? And as we consider what that great need is, revival and reformation and all that those things imply, may it happen to your church, to your faithful people who are trying to serve you. May we wake up, may we represent you so clearly and well before the world that the end can come soon is our prayer in Jesus name. Amen. This lesson is based to a considerable extent on the message to Laodicea. Let's just look at that. That's found in Revelation chapter 3 starting with verse 14. And I'm going to read the whole message and, and then that'll be our basis for talking about it right through this lesson. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, this is the message from the Amen, notice that, the faithful and true witness, notice that, who is the origin or beginning of all that God has created. I know what you have done. I know that you are neither cold nor hot. How I wish you were either one or the other. But because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Last week we learned at the end of our series on minor prophets that it really means vomit you out. You say I am rich and well off, I have all I need, but you do not know how miserable and pitiable you are. You are poor, naked, and blind. I advise you then to buy gold from me, pure gold, in order to be rich. Buy also white clothing to dress yourself and cover up your shameful nakedness. Buy also some ointments to put on your eyes so that you may see. I rebuke and punish all whom I love. Be in earnest then, and turn from your sins. Listen, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with, him, with them, and they will eat with me. To those who win the victory, I will give the right to sit down beside me on my throne, just as I have been victorious, and now sit by my Father on his throne. So that's the basic passage we're going to look at for today. This series of lessons, as you might guess, will be a discussion of what needs to happen among God's final chosen people, the Church of Laodicea, he calls them, before Jesus can come again. What do we need to do to get ready? If you were God, what would you do with a group of people described by the words we just read? Don't everybody speak at once. That's a tough assignment, isn't it? What would you do? Well, first, what is it about that that would be repugnant to him? Or, or Poor would, and blind and naked, and he's trying to take them to heaven? Why would, why would he want to spit them out of his mouth? They make him sick. They make him sick. Yeah. Pretentious piety. Nauseating. So if, if you knew those causes, well, maybe you could answer that question a little better, couldn't yeah. you? Yeah, sure. I just, I, every time I read that about vomiting out of your mouth or spitting out of your mouth, mm -hmm. I think of, you know, like in a hot summer day when the hose is running, you turn on the hose and you take a drink and it comes out hot and you just spit it out, yeah. you know, type of thing. It uh, doesn't taste good it's, and you're expecting something cool. Yeah. You know, the well, what do we know about Laodicea? We know that 
from this passage in Revelation, it is a term that applies to what group of people? Those that don't need anything. They're comfortable. Us. Okay. Us. Okay. In time, in terms of the Christian church, when is it? Since 1844. The Christian church since 1844, would that be just Seventh-day Adventists? No. No. Would it apply to all of Christendom, all who proclaim to be Christ followers from 1844 to the end? Presumably, right? They're well off financially, well off health-wise. So they probably don't need anything. And of course, then it's, they want to be politically correct. They don't want to say anything that will upset anybody. They, they just want words that tickle their ears. Mm -hmm. Laodicea was a city, the original Laodicea was a city founded by, by Antiochus II between the years 261 and 246 BC. He named it for his wife, Laodice. When crowned by well-built fortifications, the hill on which Laodicea stood, and it was at the upper end of a valley, must have appeared formidable when viewed from the lower valley, and it constituted an admirably strong line of defense. However, it did have one serious weakness. It was entirely dependent for its water supply on an aqueduct bringing water from springs about six miles to the south. The aqueduct was mostly underground, but could hardly have remained unknown to any besieging army or be guarded against its, along its full length against any attack. I mean, how would you send people out to guard a six mile long aqueduct? If the aqueduct was cut, the city was helpless. This weakness ruined the character of the city as a strong fortress and must have prevented people from ever feeling very secure when threatened with attack. Laodicea was located on the main east-west highway established by the Roman Empire. Now, what, what was the purpose of the east-west highway? Trade, army. Trade, yeah. Troops. But really, really it was a highway that was designed so that if Rome needed to move a large group of military people as quickly as possible to the east, they could. That was really what, but it ended up being the easiest way to, to travel. And so here's a, a pretty good sized city located right on the main, it would be like having your city built on the main freeway across the United States. I mean, you know, that's a great place to do business and Laodicea did the best of it. The city was famous for its school of medicine, its banking, its exchange, and manufacturing. It produced a valuable wool, soft in texture and glossy black in color. The black wool from Laodicea was especially prized because of its glossy appearance. Between Laodicea and the gate of Phrygia, through the mountain pass, so it was at the top end of a valley, and then you had to go through that valley, and that was a way to get a pass between two fairly high mountains, and so it was a very, you know, they, it was a very good place to put a city that you wanted to do business at. And that gate was called, the, the, that gate there was, was called the home of the Phrygian god Menkaru. In connection with that temple, there grew up a famous school of medicine, but the center of the school was located in Laodicea, not at the temple. Laodicea minted its own coins, bearing the serpent encircled staff of Asclepius or the figure of Zeus. What do we know about the, cir the serpent encircled staff of Asclepius? Physicians know nothing of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's become yeah. The, yeah. the symbol of medicine, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. So this was their symbol. May, they may have been the first ones to use it as a symbol of medicine. The school of medicine there at Laodicea was famous for two medicines, an ointment for strengthening the ears made from the spice nard, we don't know how well that worked, uh, and a medicine for eyes made from Phrygian stone. It seems a pretty terrible idea for me to, to put powdered stone in someone's eyes, but it was sometimes sold in powder form to be applied to the eye. The Phrygian school of medicine at Laodicea became so famous that the names Phrygia and Laodicea were often interchanged. So this, the me school of medicine there became so famous that the name of the school almost became the name of the town and vice versa. Another interesting bit of information about Laodicea, a large Jewish population lived in and around Laodicea. The temple tax of two drachmas, that was the standard amount you were supposed to pay 
to the, to the temple in Jerusalem. If you were a Jew, every Jewish male was supposed to pay two drachmas to support the temple in Jerusalem every year. Even in 62 BC now, that amounted to 15,000 drachmas just from the city of Laodicea. So how many men, Jewish men would that in mean, imply? 7,500. 7,500 Jewish free men in that district, not counting men, women and children. So by the time of John, two, almost 200 years later, or 150, 180 years later, there must have been a lot of Jews in Laodicea. The hot spring, the hot water springing out of the ground some five or six miles upriver from Laodicea was carried through aqueducts, mostly underground, until it reached Laodicea, at which time it was lukewarm. That lukewarm condition was used by the prophet John to describe the self-complacent, apathetic, and spiritually indifferent church in the final days of this earth's history. And you can find many of those details in a, on a website um, that's mentioned in our handout. While the accusations against the Laodicean church are very blunt, nevertheless God promises great things to his final end time church. What does he promise to the church? Remember the verse? Look at the first two verses, 14 and 15. To the angel of the church of Laodicea write, This is a message from the Amen, the faithful and true witness, who is the origin of all that God has created. I know what you have done. I know that you are neither cold nor hot. How I wish you were either cold or one or the other. But because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am going to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, increased, and good, and so forth. But now let's, let's back up here and look at this. Was Jesus trying to tell us that just as he created all things in the beginning, he can revive us and create us as new creatures in the image of God? I mean, if he says, why would someone call himself an amen? What does amen mean? Truth. The truth. He calls himself the faithful and true witness. Obviously, that the same kind of idea. Why would he call himself the beginning of all creation? He was the first one. Okay. And why would, why would he want to say that to us? That he was the first one? Yeah, the creator the of all things. Place. Yeah, as creator. Is, is he trying to say, hey, you know, I created everything in the beginning. Don't you think I can recreate you? That Don't you think answer I the basic existential questions. Mm -hmm. Where did we come from? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He can revive us and create us as new, new people. Well, the message, a couple comments from Ellen White. The message to the Laodicean church applies most decidedly to those whose religious experience is insipid, who do not bear decided witness in favor of the truth. Does that, would that apply to any Christians that you know? Any Seventh-day Adventists? SDA Bible Commentary. Volume 7, 962, the Ellen White comments. Insipid. Insipid. And then, what about this passage from Special Testimonies? We looked at it a week ago. The Laodicean message must be given with earnestness and power as a message from heaven. If it be ignored, the Lord will certainly cast away from him those whose spiritual condition is so objectionable. Spiritual condition is so objectionable. Christ declares that pretentious piety is nauseating to him. To the one so full of self-sufficiency, he says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. Their works are opposed to the holy principles of God's word. Special Testimony, Series B, number 2, pages 20, paragraph 1. As you look around you in the church to which you belong, do you think God would describe it as lukewarm, insipid, even pretentiously pious, and nauseating to him? I mean, look at us. We're dressed up nice. We're a bunch of nice guys, right? How could, how could, how could God say that about us? Well, when he comes <laughs> back, he says those people are going to give a uh, re review of all the good things that they did. And he says, get away, I never knew you. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, does God need to discipline us? Does God ever need to discipline his people? If you look at discipline like teach. Well, look at Hebrews 12, starting with verse 7. Endure what you suffer as being a father's punishment. 
Your suffering shows that God is treating you as his children. Was there ever a child who was not punished by his father? If you are not punished, as all his children are, it means you are not real children, but bastards. I mean, this is the Bible talking. In the case of our human fathers, they punished us and we respected them. How much more, then, should we submit to our spiritual father and live? Our human fathers punished us for a short time, as it seemed right to them, but God does it for what purpose? For our own good. For our own good, so that we may share His holiness. When we are punished, it seems to us at the time something to, be make, to make us sad, not glad. Later, however, those who have been disciplined by such punishment reap the peaceful reward of a righteous life. And we know what happens if a child is not disciplined, don't we? And there's other passages in Scripture. Psalm 94, 12, Proverbs 29, 15, and 17. What about in light of what, about in light of what we read a, bit, a little bit earlier from the Laodicean message? Do you think that the final church of God's, the final end time church of God's people might need any disciplining? And if so, how should God discipline them? Do, do parents give their children the option of choosing what they discipline they're going to get? Are you suggesting some sort of boot camp for well, the end times? If we need revival and reformation, how do you, how does, here's, here's the question. I mean, to put it as bluntly as possible, a change needs to happen. How do I know for sure that a change needs to happen? We're not in heaven yet, right? If we were doing everything we were supposed to be doing, where would we be? We would be in heaven, right? I mean, I don't know, that sounds like a pretty convincing argument to me. Would have been there over a hundred years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Well, does that mean we're illegitimate children? That's not a very what if you're punished? attractive idea, is it? If you're well, the word, do you feel like you're being punished by God? Well, things could go better. <laughs> 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 you want more blessings from God, is that what you're saying? <laughs> you know, a lot of things happen. Okay, now let's get into the meat of the Laodicean message. You say, I'm rich and well off, I have all I need, but you do not know how miserable and pitiful you are. You are poor, naked, and blind. Now, let's be, let's be very practical and very down to earth here. How would it, or is it even possible for a group of intelligent or reasonably intelligent Christians living at the end of this earth's history with all the Bible open in front of us to be that mistaken about our about about ourselves is that really even possible let you think about that one for a moment well the illustration's pretty striking mm -hmm. because obviously we're not naked hungry dirty or whatever and yet um, God says we are mm -hmm. so um, what does he mean by that? Yeah. Do you think there's any possibility that you out there or your church or even your Sabbath school class could be described as poor, blind, and naked? There's a thought. How could Jesus describe the religious leaders of the Jews in his day as, remember, the religious leaders in Jesus' day, John 8, he's addressing them, Bible reading, Sabbath keeping, tithe paying Adventists, weren't they Adventists? They were waiting for the Messiah, right? That means they were waiting for the first Advent, right? And still say that they were descendants of their father, the devil? Maybe I need to read that. John eight forty four. in case you haven't looked at it recently. You are the children of your father, the devil, and you want to follow your father's desires. From the very beginning, he was a murderer, he has never been on the side of truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he's only doing what is natural to him because he's a liar and the father of all lies. 
I mean, what would we, what would someone say, to, say to us today if we destri- tried to describe their father like that? Would that make them happy? Well, uh, pretty, pretty serious stuff, right? It's, it's not just pointing to a father, it's pointing to them because if sure. that's their father, they're, they're getting the finger pointed at them. Mm-hmm. Well, what about, Ma- let's just take some other end time prophecies. Matthew 25, 1 to 13. We all are familiar with the, mess, the, the story of the, of the ten virgins. What happened to the ten virgins? They all went out. They were prepared for the wedding. They were prepared to meet the bridegroom. They were going to go into the wedding. It was going to be a grand and glorious occasion, right? And what happened? Well, the celebration was delayed. and they The all bridegroom just... was late. That's usually we talk about the bride being late, but in this case it was the bridegroom that was late. And what happened? Every one of the, bride, the bridesmaids did what? Went to sleep. They went to sleep. And suddenly, the bridegroom shows up and what? Found them sleeping. Found them sleeping. And what's happening with their lamps? They're all, lamps are burning low. How many of them have extra oil with them? Only five of them. Only five out of the ten. And the others said, oh, just share some of your oil. And what did they say? No, I mean... I think it wasn't that they didn't want to be jealous. I mean, didn't want to be generous. They just knew that if they shared the little bit of oil they had, their lamps would be going out in the middle of the ceremony, right? So they said, uh, go find your own. And of course, we know what happens. They went to find oil. And when they finally found oil, they came back and the door was closed. Well, look at Revelation 3, moving on a couple more verses. So verses does 8. Does that mean that we're all asleep? Not Seventh day Adventist Christians, surely. And what does asleep mean? What does asleep mean? We're going to talk about that in a moment. So hold your question. Look at verses 18 and 19. I advise you then to buy gold from me, pure gold, in order to be rich. Buy also white clothing to dress yourself and cover up your shameful nakedness. Buy also some ointment to put on your eyes so that you may see. I rebuke and punish all whom I love. Be in earnest then and turn from your sins. Now, what do we have to pay for all these precious treasures? Does he tell us what the price is? Not right here. Elsewhere he says it's free. It's free. Well, how can we take advantage of these remedies that Jesus was suggesting for us? What kind of people are sealed by the Holy Spirit? And I read now from SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 4, page 1161, and it's paragraph 6, I paragraph uh, 6, yes. Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, it is not any seal or mark that can be seen by human beings, that would be, but a settling into the truth both intellectually and spiritually so they cannot be moved. Just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. And what, at what time does the shaking come? How close is it to the second coming? Just before. Very close. Very close, yeah. Indeed, it has begun already, already, Ellen White says. The judgments of God are now upon the land to give us warning that we may know what is coming. Found that repeated in a number of different places in her writings. Are there reasons why we do not want Jesus to enter our lives? Are there sins that we would prefer to keep hidden? What stands between us and a true faith relationship with God? Sin. Sin? Come on, you couldn't be describing us as a bunch of sinners, surely. We don't think of it as sin. We think of it as wanting things for ourselves. You know, mm-hmm. Time, uh, material things. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, there are sins that we want to make public. 
I see. I, I think we don't want him because we don't have one of his ways. Okay. That may be the problem right there. You mean we don't want to act loving all the time? Well, we'd rather be selfish that, once in a while. The things that bring that about is not exactly um, <laughs> well to some people. What can I say? Well, look at Revelation 3, verse 20, you know, the next verse. I rebuke and punish all whom I love. Be in earnest then and turn from your sins. So it's pretty clear what he wants us to do, right? Well, look at Song of Solomon, chapter 5, starting with verse 2. And this is presumably God talking to his church. While I slept, my heart was awake. I dreamt my lover knocked at the door. Let me come in, my darling, my sweetheart, my dove. My head is wet with dew and my hair is damp from the mist. And the woman responds, I have already undressed. Why should I get dressed again? I have washed my feet. Why should I get them dirty again? My lover put his hand to the door and I was thrilled that he was near. I was ready to let him come in. My hands were covered with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh as I grasped the handle of the door. And apparently, God wants us to feel something like that toward Him. Does He really want us to have an intimate, personal relationship with, with Him? Yeah. What would it be like for us to have an intimate relationship with an infinite God? An intimate relationship of eternal life. with an infinite God. John, John 17. 17, verse 3. To know God is... Life, Life eternal. eternal. So does, how does he get people to love him like that? To know him is to love him. Can he force that? No. No. The challenge is for us is to, is to get to know him. Well, Jesus pictured himself as standing at the door and knocking. He will never force his way in, but he wants to eat with us. In the setting of the Middle Eastern culture, the evening meal is very important. It is a family gathering where often there are several generations who sit down together and talk and counsel and plan. It is a time of great fellowship. So that's the kind of thing that God is asking us to, to be participate in, to, to participate with Him in. Look at verse 21 now. To those who win the victory, I will give the right to sit beside me on my throne, just as I have been victorious and now set, sit by my Father on His throne. If you have ears then, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Do you think it's possible that we will actually sit down beside God on His throne? <laughs> How can that physically happen. Yeah. I mean, if you have, well, let's say we have 144,000 people being saved, um, that's got to be a big throne to have everybody mm -hmm. sit around. To, well, so and, and look, at the, look I mean, at the rest of that. God already has hundreds of millions of angels waiting to do His every bidding. They have never rebelled against Him. Why would He ask us, former sinners, to sit down beside Him while He's on the throne Will we displace the angels? I mean, what's going on here? Sounds like there's some representation going on. Well, why do you think he would, he apparently wants to spend the rest of eternity in close association with former sinners? Why would he want that? Well, with such a prospect before us, what could possibly hold us back from responding positively? I mean, God says, I want to be your personal friend. I want to interact with you. I want to be, you know, I want you to sit on my throne alongside me for the rest of eternity. And we would say, oh, no, that's not, you know, raise the price a little, right? I mean, you know, what more could God possibly offer us? But what do we have to do to gain it? In order to participate, we must experience a true revival and reformation. Well, what is that? Well, let me use the words here from Ellen White 
This is Review and Her Herald, February 25, 1902, uh, paragraph 7 and 8. God calls for a spiritual revival and a spiritual reformation. Unless this takes place, those who are lukewarm will continue to grow more abhorrent to the Lord until he will refuse to acknowledge them as his children. That doesn't sound like a very good prospect, does it? A revival and a reformation must take place under the ministration of the Holy Spirit. We talked about the sealing of the Holy Spirit earlier. Revival and reformation are, the two, are two different things. Revival signifies a renewing of spiritual life a quickening of the powers of mind and heart, a resurrection from spiritual death. You come back to life. Revival. Reformation signifies a reorganization, a change in ideas and theories, habits and practices. Reformation will not bring forth the good fruit of righteousness unless it is connected with the revival of the Spirit. Revival and reformation are to do their appointed work, and in doing this work, they must blend. Well, one of the surprising things about the Laodicean message is that God suggested that he would rather have us be cold than be lukewarm. How could that possibly be? Well, at least then you've made a decision one way or the other. Okay. We will have made a decision. Anybody else? Why would God say, I'd rather have you be cold, be nice to have you hot, but I would rather have you cold instead of being lukewarm? Why? Well, when you're lukewarm, I, I, I just go back to you're rich and comfortable. Mm -hmm. How do you inspire a group like that? Yeah, I mean, we're, I, we're a bunch of people sitting in a jacuzzi. Yeah. I mean, you know. How do you light a fire on people like that? Yeah. It's too comfortable. They don't need a fire. <laughs> they don't need a fire. So why would, would God rather have us be cold than lukewarm? Who, who's more comfortable, the lukewarm person sitting in his jacuzzi or somebody who's cold? The cold person at least recognizes he needs some help, right? right. So which one of these groups is most likely to seek a change? Well, one of the problems that is well known among Seventh-day Adventists in the more developed countries of the world is the fact that even when we convince people to join the church, we find that before long, they often leave. Many of them leave. Careful studies have been done to try to determine why some people stay and why others leave. This research has demonstrated that there are three things that tend to keep people in the church long term. You know what they are? Well, one, and you have to have two of these three if you're really going to remain faithful to the church. One, you must have a firm belief and conviction about the truths taught by the church. So there are people who stay by, at least partly, because they're really convinced we have the right message. Two, they get involved in church activities and responsibilities. If they feel like they're making a contribution, that they're a part of the organization, and they're actively involved, it's much less likely that they're going to leave. Okay? And three, they develop a close personal relationship or friendship with some group of their new fellow Christians. And therefore, they don't feel, I mean, they feel comfortable, they're, they're, they're drawn in, they feel a part of something, and it's a lot more difficult for them to sort of drop out. And partly that's because what happens if you don't show up at, let's say, a, a small Bible study group? What, do, what, hap what happens if you don't show up? Somebody gets on the phone and say, hey, how come you're not here, right? And what happens if you belong to a church where there's thousands of members? It's way too easy to slip in and slip back out again, isn't it? Without too many people noticing. So I think it's we have a pretty good idea why it is that those things are so essential for keeping church members and keeping them faithful. Well, what about it? Are we doing our best to reach out and put our spiritual arms around new believers, showing them that we want to be their friends and encouraging them to become a part of the church and, becoming, and become active in the church? 
What are, we, what are we doing to try to get people to Sabbath school class, to church? How many of the people, let's say in our church, the University Church here at Loma Linda, how many people that attend that church do you suppose in the, in the week previous ask someone to come to church? Someone else who's not an Adventist or even a backsliding Adventist. I'm afraid the percentage would be pretty low. Do well, you think that they would be asking them to do something that would be, that they would know they would enjoy? I mean, mm -hmm. do you think, do you think that um, what's going on in the church is, is enough to actually bring somebody in to try to? That's a good question. I can tell you my personal experience and my wife's experience. We were members of a small church in Baltimore, Maryland, and, and while I was attending school at Johns Hopkins University doing my master's in public health. We happened by chance to meet up with two different ladies. I met up with one at school and my wife met up with one in the laundromat. And we, we talked to them about, a little bit about religious things and so forth. And after a period of time, we invited each one of them to come to church. Neither one of them ever stopped. It's they, they, that, that little church was alive, I will tell you, it was alive. And when they showed up, everybody was putting their arms around them and said, we're so happy you're here, and they would call them and so forth like this. And I mean, the one day, one time when they were hooked. But what if the church wasn't alive? Well, that's the, why are we talking about revival? What does revival mean? Bring Bringing back people back from the dead to the life, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, here's a special challenge to revival in our church. How to approach our own young people. Is it really possible for a young person to become more interested in Bible study than in the latest movie? I mean, look at the excitement over the, the movies or perhaps internet games, or even more intimately, one's favorite sin? I don't know, do you think so? I'm just asking, I get to ask the questions. <laughs> How can we make the religious experience of those in our church more than just a few hours a week on Sabbath morning kind of experience? I mean, let's be honest, don't you think that if the church is going to have a revival and a reformation, it's going to have to have more than just a Sabbath morning experience. I don't know, it sure, it sure seems so to me. Well, there's only one criteria that God is really looking for, for, for the people he, he, He's going to save and take to heaven. What's that one criteria? Willingness to listen and take instruction. Okay, and that would describe someone who is safe to live next door to for the rest of eternity, right? Who puts God first in their lives. What about us? Would we be safe to live next door to for the rest of eternity? Well, you could probably leave the door unlocked. The neighbors could. What about the Samaritan woman who had five husbands and now was living with a sixth man? Do you think you'd be comfortable living next door to her? Would you dare to live next door to a Pharisee? What about living next door to the two former demoniacs? And these are people that, you know, sound like maybe they were converts of Jesus. Yeah, and where did they, how much lessons, how many lessons, how many experiences did they have and yet when they, Jesus and the disciples ended up back there the second time there was a big group mm -hmm. that learned from them it was something uh, amazing it, it, it really is well what would go ahead how about the uh, two that walked by the uh, the man on the road that, mm -hmm. that the Good Samaritan eventually helped would we want to live next door to them what about that well, you wouldn't want to get in trouble. I mean, 
physical trouble with them around, that's for sure. It may not help, huh? It won't help. What, what would happen if Jesus himself appeared as a human being and delivered the Laodicean message to our church some Sabbath morning? How would we respond? Is our spiritual condition and the condition of our fellow church members such that we need disciplining, even a rebuke at times? I mean, these are very personal, very difficult questions. This is, this is not any laughing matter. Well, there's, there are people that are willing to do that. <laughs> I mean, to do the rebuking part. I oh, don't yeah. know if it's the other way, if it's the um, receiving end, but... Are you one of those, Gary? I hope not. <laughs> well, we traditionally have believed, the Bible teaches, that there's going to, there was an early rain, and when was the early rain? And the Pentecost. Pentecost. Okay. <laughs> what happened? Look for a moment at Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost came, all the believers were gathered together in one place. They were fellowshipping together, right? Suddenly there was a noise from the sky which sounded like a strong wind blowing, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then they saw what looked like tongues of fire which spread out and touched each person there. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to talk in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. And of course, a little while later, Peter spoke up. And what was the result? Thousands. Three thousand people joined the Christian church in one day. And what's going to be the relationship between the latter rain and the former rain? in terms of impact and size and so forth? Even more impact. Supposed to be more. Could we, can you think of anything we would do, we could do, that would bring 3,000 people into the church in one day? Well, God's going to have to do that. God's going to have to do that. Maybe he would like to use us to help him. Well, he, using us, but to think of how God's got to inspire that. Uh, do we know anything about an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the in the in our in church in our day and more recent times? Can you think of anything? Well, we know about it being stopped. Whoa! Hold on here. There's a very interesting and very provocative comment by Ellen White in Volume 1 of Selected Messages, starting page 234. Let, let, let me just read that. Let's think about this for a moment. It's talking about the 1888 General Conference. I presume most of you, are, all of us I know here have heard about it. I hope you in our audience have, have heard about this, know a little bit about what happened at the Minneapolis General Conference in 1888. This is Ellen White's comment some years later, writing from Australia, looking back. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith, quoting Galatians 3, 24. In this scripture, the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle, is speaking especially of the moral law. And why was that an issue? Because that was one of the questions. What law is it referring to in Galatians? Okay, and what did we what does it, what was the usual attitude of the Adventist Church about that question? We said, Ellen White told us in the Bible suggests that the law is a transcript of God's character, right? And how can you say that a transcript of God's character is added? I mean, hasn't God always been there? Don't we claim, you know, and Ellen White says, we've been preaching the law and the law till so long we're like the dry as, we're as dry as the hills of Gilboa. Well, here's what she said when that great issue came up at the General Conference. And she was there in person. In this scripture, she says, the Holy Spirit through the apostles speaking especially of the moral law. The moral law was added. That's what it said, right? You go back to verse 19. 
there in Galatians 3. The law reveals sin to us and causes us to feel our need of Christ and to flee unto him for pardon and peace by exercising repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And then these very provocative words, an unwillingness to yield up preconceived opinions. Now, do any of us have preconceived opinions? Well, don't answer that question, at least not out loud. And to accept this truth, the truth about what? About the law, about its relationship to us as his final end time church, right? An unwilling to, lay, uh, to, to yield up preconceived opinion and accept this truth lay at the foundation of a large share of the opposition manifested at Minneapolis against the Lord's message to Brethren E.J. Wagner and A.T. Jones. By exciting that opposition, Satan succeeded. Who did what? Satan succeeded in shutting away from our people in a great measure the special power of the Holy Spirit that God longed to impart to them. What's the special power of the Holy Spirit that God longs to impart to us? That part where he inspires us. The latter rain. Don't we call that the latter rain? The enemy prevented them from obtaining that efficiency. Isn't the Holy Spirit, uh, the, the latter rain, supposed to give us extra efficiency? Prevented them from obtaining that efficiency which might have been theirs in carrying the truth to the world as the apostles proclaimed it after the day of Pentecost. The light that is to lighten the whole earth with its glory was resisted and by the action of our own brethren has been in a great degree kept away from the world. Volume 1, Selected Messages, 234 and 235. You better be very careful when you talk like that. Our own brethren turned off the latter rain? Well, it, it is kind of hard to know what was going on there. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I think if we actually brought it back, it would stir up a lot of other people, too. Mm -hmm. um, I know that the Holy Spirit's supposed to come, mm -hmm. but um, it isn't going to come until we understand what was happening back then. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's a, there's, there's a mystery in there that needs to be brought out. Well, it's very interesting that the information that I just read to you was sent by Ellen White from Australia. Very almost special delivery. She, was, er, she got up like 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning to write this out, had it copied very early in the morning, sent it down to get it on the boat in time to go to the U.S., went to the U.S. with seven copies were made, and they went directly to the general conference president, to the editor of the review, and so forth. And what do you think happened? It was buried. shelved. It was buried. Nobody heard it, a word of it, for 56 years. And finally, someone dug it up, in Ellen White's writings and said, I think we need, to, we need to look at this. And now it's in the book, Selected Messages, 234 and 235. Well, does that tell us anything about revival and reformation? So are we keeping the Holy Spirit away too? And how are I we I hate to that think that is a possibility, are. but I always have to remind myself we're still here. We're not in the kingdom of heaven yet. Is that a clue? Mm -hmm. Is it really possible that our General Conference Committee in session in Minneapolis in 1888 stopped the outpouring of the latter rain? And of course, is that still going on or could it happen again? Those are tough questions. We're talking, we're going to be talking this whole 13th Sabbath about revival and reformation. And here's an example right in front of us. Well, look at Galatians 5, verse 6. 
For when we are in union with Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor the lack of it makes any difference at all. What matters is faith that works through love. Faith that works through love. Okay? What's faith that works through love? Is that a special kind of faith or? Well, it's faith in love, for okay. one thing. Um, okay. Faith in love as opposed to faith in, faith in force, you know. Where okay. People like to force people to do things, to get things done. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you have faith in? Well, if you exchange the word faith for trust, as we've done mm -hmm. before, you're trusting the love of God to okay. make something happen. Okay. Faith that works by love. God pleads with us to buy, go, buy of him gold tried in the fire, white linen and ice have. Revelation 19.8 gives us a little bit of a clue. Look at that. 19.8. She has been given clean, shining linen to wear. The linen is the good deeds of God's people. So what, what's going to happen? What do God's people need to be doing here? Good deeds. Good deeds. Now this is not suggesting that we're saved by works, but this means that those who have faith that works by love, it means if we have real, the real faith that God is looking for, the kind of revival and reformation kind of faith that God is looking for, we will not be able to keep quiet about it. I mean, could the disciples, I mean, disciples knew, it's there in Pentecost, in Jerusalem, they knew what had happened to Jesus, right? And they were there in the temple, preaching the gospel every day. Did they think there's a possibility that what happened to Jesus could happen to them? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, well, looking back at Laodicea. Laodicea was a banking center. They believed that they were rich and did not need any help. Spiritually, don't we believe that we have the truth? Shouldn't that make us spiritually rich? What are we still lacking? I mean, we've got the truth, right? We not only have the Bible, we have all the writings of Ellen White. I mean, have in, has any generation in history been more spiritually blessed than we are? I don't know, I don't know we have how it, it strikes you. We have translations and we have it on our iPads in mm -hmm. written form, on our computers, uh, hopefully in our heads too. Look at, look at R Matthew 22, the first 14 verses. Jesus again used parables in talking to the people. The kingdom of heaven is like this. Once there was a king who prepared a wedding feast for his son. He sent his servants to tell the invited guests to come to the feast, but they did not want to come. So he sent other servants with this message for the guests. My feast is ready now. My bullocks and prize calves have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But the invited guests paid no attention and went about their business. One went to his farm, another to his shop, while others grabbed the servants beat them and killed them. The king was very angry, so he sent his soldiers who killed those murderers and burnt down their city. Then he called his servants and said to them, My wedding feast is ready, but the people I invited did not deserve it. Now go to the main streets and invite to the feast as many people as you find. Does that say anything to us about how we're supposed to spread the gospel? So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, good and bad alike, and the wedding hall was filled with people. Now, one thing you need to understand is that in ancient Near Eastern custom, the king would provide garments for everyone to wear. He didn't want anyone to look ill-clothed or poorly clothed in his, at his fancy wedding, so he wanted everyone to have nice clothes, and so he provided the garments for them. So now that becomes significant when we look at the next portion of this parable. The king went in to look at the guests and, see how, and saw a man who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The king asked him. But the man said nothing. 
Then the king told the servants, tie him up hand and foot and throw him, out, throw him outside in the dark. There he will cry and grind his teeth. And Jesus concluded, many are invited, but few are chosen. So, how do we put on the righteousness of Christ? How do we accept him so that we can become alive once again? Well, there's really only one way. I mean, we need to be really blunt about this. There's only one way that we can do all that. It's Bible study, prayer, and sharing. Why is witnessing or sharing such an important part of revival and reformation? Because you get, it's a two-way discussion, for mm -hmm. one thing. It kind of helps okay. you. Um, what happens when you have to try to explain something to someone else? You, you understand it much better yourself. You better understand it pretty well yourself. Well, I can tell that, you from my own personal experience with these programs. <laughs> not only that, but um, you understand how other people are thinking, and you uh, find out that your ways of talking may not be penetrating. And if you mm -hmm. talk to them and find out what they're getting out of it, you can kind of help. Well, the purpose of Bible study, prayer, and sharing is to learn more about God. And as Jim pointed out a little while ago, John 17, 3, to know God is life eternal. We know from Great Controversy, page 555, it's by beholding, by getting to know Him better, that we can become changed to become like Him. Don't we believe that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is God's final last day church? Will the Seventh-day Adventist Church be able to survive as an organization when there is a national and later an international Sunday law forbidding worship on the Sabbath? What would become of our church organization at that time? How would you describe your own personal relationship with Christ? Do you long for a deeper, closer relationship every day? Or are you hoping for just enough of a relationship to squeak into heaven? Is that a safe approach? I hope that this first in this series of lessons has opened your eyes a little bit and challenged you to think because there's some really, really intense things to think about in this series. Hope you'll be with us every time.